Please welcome Todd Conklin. Amazing. <laughs> amazing job. Thanks, brother. Amazing. You're amazing. OK, can everyone see me? What if I stand like this? Is it like a knife blade? <laughs> so before we get started, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but I kind of feel like this is going to be the best presentation I've ever given because I got a sign. So yesterday, I couldn't be here earlier because I had to teach a class yesterday. So I'm teaching a class. It's a room full of operators. It's not the best class ever. That's you guys. It's like the, maybe the second or third best class. And in the middle of class, this guy sitting kind of in the middle of the room, his phone starts ringing. And I should tell you, that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I'm always kind of glad it's their phone and not my phone, so I don't give a crap, right? But the poor guy, he looks horrified because his phone's ringing, and I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking back at him, and I think, I don't think he knows what to do. <laughs> so I just said really casually, kind of cool, I said, if you need to get that phone, you can. And the guy looks visibly relieved. Only problem is, he then actually answers the phone and takes the call in the middle of the class, in the middle of the room. And it's my fault, right? So he picks up the phone and he goes, yeah, which I believe is how you guys say good morning. Am I translating that correctly? Is that right? Then there's a long pause and he goes, I'm in training. And then there's a pause and he says, it's all day. And that one had a blade in it. I felt that one hit me pretty hard. And then he says the most amazing thing. This is totally true, you guys. He says, doesn't suck as much as I thought it would. <laughs> so if you're cool with this, I'd kind of like, like make that the standard. This is going to suck, but it's not going to suck nearly as bad as it could suck. So before I get started, can I, I, it seems like a waste with this much brilliance in a room to not actually ask you guys a question. So can I get a piece of advice from you before I get started? Are you cool with that? Is that fine? So what's December like at your plant? And I mean, don't tell me the weather, I get the weather. Like, is it a busy month or a not very busy month? Is December, like, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but December where I work is my favorite month because everybody looks busy, but nobody's doing crap. You know what I mean? You're all kind of stalling and waiting for the holiday. And the best part of December is every meeting you go to, it's a pretty good bet somebody's gonna bring treats, right? like cake or cookies or fudge or chocolate bacon, right, 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 right? And a really good meeting's got two or three of those things. So I love December. December's my, in fact, I made a rule a long time ago that I don't travel at all during December. So last year, not, not this last December, but the one past that, I'm sitting in my office looking busy. It's December, right? And the phone rings and I pick it up and this guy on the other end says, Dr. Conklin, um, it's good to meet you. We've had an accident, and my boss would like you to come and help us do a peer assist investigation. And of course, I say the same thing you guys would say. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. How can I help you? Anything I got you can have, I'm more than happy to help you. And the guy says, well, my boss would really like you to come and actually visit the site. And I said, well, when do you want me to come? And he said, can you be here tomorrow? And I said, oh, it's December. I'm super busy and there's a lot of meetings. And the guy said, well, we really, really need you. And he's kind of pushing me pretty hard. So I think, well, I don't know what happened. So I asked the big question, is it a fatality? Are there serious injuries? And the guy on the phone says to me, no, nobody's hurt. It's a property damage event. Well, you guys, I hardly cared when he called. <clears throat> now you'd have to find a vacuum pump to measure how little I care now. <laughs> so I say to him, why don't we do it in January? I've got some open time in January. And the guy says, we really need you now. And then he says something amazing. He says, we're a really big oil and gas company. I'm not supposed to say the name, but it rhymes with Revron. That's all I'm going to say. 
And he said, we're not used to people telling us no. And I said, well, maybe today's the day we practice that. <laughs> no, right? So the phone call ends, and I hang up the phone, and I think, Phew, that was a close one, right? I mean, I almost got pulled out in December. Two minutes later, they call back. Two minutes later, and the guy says, I think I forgot to tell you something really important. And I said, well, what'd you forget to tell me? And he said, the accident happened in Thailand. It happened on a beach. You can uh, take your family and we'll pay for it. <clears throat> so I said, there's some time opening up in my calendar. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I would have led with that, right? That, that's, the, that's the going in thing. So I fly to Thailand. I get to Thailand, and I get over to, it's, it's, a, it's an offshore loading platform, and it's a temporary operation. Now, before I go much further with you guys, and you're a good crowd to ask this to, how long is temporary in your organization? Yeah, so I asked my guys, and I had a guy look me in the eye and say, 20 years. Then he paused and said, Lest we need it longer, we'll keep it longer, right? So they've been using this site for eight years, and what's interesting is they basically had a temporary fences and a job trailer and porta potties. It was a pretty temporary operation, and they had a crane on a concrete pad, and they were loading these offshore boats in a thing called super sacks. Now you're probably a pretty good group. I spend a lot of time defining what super sacks are, but if you don't know, they're those big bags you put crap in. They're big, right? They're super sacks, hence the name. And they're loading these boats. Everything they're loading, they're loading in super sacks. Every single thing they're loading. And they're pretty darn good at it because they haven't had a bunch of failures until the one I went over for. Now, what they're loading on the one they dropped was a really expensive piece of equipment. They put it in the super sack, and instead of hooking up the super sack by taking the, you know, those, those loops on the top of it? Instead of hooking those up on the crane, what they did is they took a piece of tagline and they tied those loops together with a whole bunch of knots. Now, why would you tie a lot of knots? Anybody know? I'm going to give you a secret weapon, okay? If you can't tie a knot, tie a lot. <laughs> More is better. Uh, trust me. I think it's cute that Mike put me as the guy right before lunch because I promise you one thing, you guys. We will not be late for lunch. <laughs> That gets the biggest applause. <laughs> so they tie this all up, and they're going to lift it, and, and they're going to do the pick. They're going to lift the load, and they're going to swing it in and put it in this boat. And the way they do this, because the crane really doesn't move around very much because it's on these concrete pads in the sand, they've got a barricaded alleyway with these red X's on the sand. And every time they fly a load, it flies exactly in the same place. And so they're pretty good at keeping people out from underneath it. So they do the pick, they lift the load up, and they're swinging this big bag dangling on a little string down that alleyway, and what do you think happens? Yeah, so it's got to fall, or this story's super stupid, right? In fact, the load falls, and it damages a really, really expensive piece of equipment, and it's a big stinking deal. But here's the question I want to ask you. When it fell, it fell in that exclusion zone. So there's nobody there. They respected the exclusion zone. And when it fell, it fell on one of those red X's. Now, near as I can tell you guys, that's 10 extra points, right? I mean, that's, that's, if you're playing along at home, that's a good deal. Here's my question. Is that a success or a failure? What do you guys think? Because you're a really good crowd to ask. How many of you think it's a failure? They dropped a really expensive piece of equipment. They dropped a load. Show of hands. Okay, how many of you think it's a success? Oh, good, okay. Let me give you a third. How many of you hate voting by raising your hands? <laughs> yeah, I just want to get that out early so we can make that happen. Well, here's what's interesting, is how you look at that is going to color what you fix. Because if you look at it as those guys screwed up, I bet you a buck what we're going to fix is those guys. But if you look at the fact that not everything on earth fits in a sack, then you're going to start thinking about how that process works. And the investigation, I'll just be really honest, you guys, I drug that baby out as long as I could. 
Beer's like 35 cents. There's really no reason to leave there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but eventually they made me go home. So I get on a plane and I fly from Bangkok, Thailand to Los Angeles, California. I don't know how many of you guys in this room have been to LAX, the airport in Los Angeles, but I'm pretty convinced if you're a bad enough person and God sends you to hell, you'll connect through LAX. <laughs> I get off the plane and I walk what seems like a thousand miles to my next gate and the airline says to me, your flight's been canceled. And then they say these words, the next flight we can get you on is two days from now. And I thought, I didn't really buy a ticket for two days from now. And I think I have two choices. I can roll up into a ball right there in front of that lady and start crying, which actually felt like the right thing to do at that point. Or I can take the future into my own hands. And if you've been to LAX, where I was, I'm not supposed to say the name of the airline, but they're not that good with dogs, and they were united in making sure I wouldn't fly. <laughs> right across the parking lot in LAX is a small peanut-related airline from Dallas. I don't want to say their name, but if you're in the Southwest, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I zoom over there and I go to the counter, and I've learned something really early. There's people you need to be nice to on Earth. The people you need to be nice to are those counter agents, because they can solve your problem immediately. So I went in with a lot of charm, and I got a lot of charm to give, right? And I said, my flight was canceled. I need to get back to New Mexico. The lady looked at me, and she said, there's a flight in 45 minutes. I can get you on it, and I'll escort you through security. Well, this is a perfect deal. So she takes me through, and I get on the plane. Now, for those of you that have flown Southwest, what is a first class seat on Southwest Airlines? If you haven't flown Southwest, let me explain something to you really quickly. The way they load a plane on Southwest Airlines is they line everybody up at the gate and then a lady shoots a gun and says, go. <laughs> and there's no assigned seats. And so the best seat you can have on the whole earth is an aisle seat near the front with nobody next to you. So I get on a plane, and sure enough, you guys, there's a big scary biker sitting next to the window. He's gonna be perfect. Open seat, and I sit down. And then everybody else comes in, and what I do is I sit there and I try to look as big and as sweaty as I possibly can look. <laughs> and then what I do is I just hold the barf bag. <laughs> I'm not gonna use it, I mean, don't get me wrong but I want it to look like at any moment I can use it. And then as people board the plane, the secret weapon is I used to not have eye contact with them. I used to look away, that's stupid. The secret weapon is to have a lot of eye contact. Like cross the line from creepy over into weird, you know what I mean? <laughs> so pretty soon the entire plane fills up, the whole plane fills up, and there's one open seat, one seat, and it's between me and the biker guy. And I look at him, and he looks at me, and I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it was love at first sight. I mean, we just, and they're getting ready to shut the door, and I think we've done it. And as they pull that door shut, I hear a voice from that hallway say, got one more person. Well, I tense up, because there's no question where this person's going to sit. And she gets on the plane, and she starts walking down that center aisle, and I am not judging you guys but she was a big one. <laughs> and I knew that because the people around me were saying things like, how are they gonna do this? <laughs> she comes down and she lines up right with me and the biker and she looks down at us, this is totally true to you guys, she looks down at us and she says, raise them armrests boys, we're going for a ride. <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, at that moment, I fell in love with her. The biker was gone, and she was hilarious. It was like riding in a big hug, but she was super funny. About halfway on the trip, she decides she's going to read the newspaper. Now, remember, this is December a year ago, right? So keep the timing in mind. 
I don't know if you know this, but if you're the middle person in an airline seat and you read the newspaper, you've pretty much committed everyone around you to read the newspaper. <laughs> so she opens up the newspaper and right in front of my face, I mean just boom, right there, is a headline that says, by the year 2020, Volvo, the car company, is going to make a fatality-free car. Did you guys read this? Because if you haven't read this, I would highly encourage you to go back and look this up. Because I think this fits you guys perfectly. By the year 2020, Volvo's going to make a, a fatality-free car. Now, they just had an accident last week, right? But that was a person on the outside of the car. I think they mean people on the inside of the car. I know that's a little creepy to say, but I mean, that's what they mean. What do you think when you see a headline that says, by the year 2020, they make a fatality-free car? What, do you think it's possible? So here's how today will work. I'll ask you questions, then I'll look at you kind of lovingly. That's what's going on now. <laughs> when I do that, say something back to me. It's a big room. I need to hear something. Do you think it's possible? Well, here's what's interesting to me, is I think if you look at that, that challenge is really, really important. Let me ask it this way. In your opinion, what's the most important safety feature in a car? Driver, seatbelt, did somebody scream the word airbag from this area? Were you saying airbag or were you calling me an airbag? Because it's different. I mean, <laughs> that felt accusatory to me at some level. So driver, seatbelt, airbag, what else? Rear seat DVD player, that's for sanity. That's, that's a smart idea every way around that, unless, unless you get tired of listening to Frozen a million times. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah, that's good. The frame, the chassis, the design. Well, let's start, let's start with seat belts. What do you think a seat belt's job is? Yeah, restraint, right? Everybody good with restraint? You want to lock it in? Final answer? How freaked out would you be if I told you that a seatbelt's primary function is no longer simply restraint. And it has to do with airbags. I don't know if you've thought about this very much, but a seat and a seatbelt ensure the positioning of the people inside the vehicle so they are where the designers believe they are when the car crashes. In fact, I don't know if you've thought about this, but cars have a different understanding of what safety success is than industry does. About 60 years ago, car manufacturers got together and they said, huh, asking drivers to not wreck feels like the right thing to do, but it doesn't really equate into fewer crashes. Maybe the way we're defining success is wrong. And then they said something super controversial. Ready? Here's what they said. All accidents are not preventable. In fact, they said, the people in these vehicles are too important to try to manage them based upon some kind of mysterious probability. Let's just assume that every car that drives on the road has a 100% chance it's going to wreck every single time we drive it. Now, for those of us in this room, that's not important. But put your kids in the car, or put your grandkids in the car, and think about that idea. What car manufacturers said is, our definition of safety has to change. We don't manage accidents. In fact, accidents manage us. What we manage is the car's ability to have an accident. And what happened is, they aggressively, aggressively changed safety in a vehicle. And if you want to look at a good safety story, vehicle safety is an amazing safety story to look at. But here's my challenge. If industrial safety people were in charge of vehicle safety, Volvo could not make that claim. Because if industrial safety people were in charge of vehicle safety, here's what vehicle safety would look like. Before you drive, you got to go to the training center and take the mandatory class that's offered every Tuesday, don't wreck. There's 41 slides, and they all say the same thing. Don't wreck. Well, some say if you care more, you'll wreck less, right? Some say we're going to observe your wrecking behavior, right? But all of them are going to say don't wreck. And then at the end of the class, you take a test, and if you pass the test, you get a card that says you're a certified not wrecker. 
and then you get to drive around and not wreck. And once a year, we'll make you take the refresher course on not wrecking, but it's on the web, so you just mouse around and click don't wreck, and everyone will say, we're a wreck-free facility. And we'll put a banner out front that says 100% wreck-free. And we'll put a clock by the driveway that counts the number of wrecks we have, and we will tell people, don't wreck. And they'll drive around until somebody wrecks, and then we'll stand down driving operations, we'll bring everybody into a big room, and some senior manager will get up in front of you and read the procedure on not wrecking louder and slower. What part of not wrecking did you not hear the last time we had this discussion? Right? What's <laughs> You're clapping because it's true. What's crazy about that is that's wrong. And the belief that somehow you would choose to wreck, well, that's crazy talk, right? What we do is we don't manage the accident. What we manage is the ability to have the accident. And that shift in thinking is everything. So let me show you a couple slides because they went to a bunch of work to show this to you. I want to show you my first slide because it'll sort of set the theme for the day. This isn't it. Ignore this slide. Do not look at it. It's not the one. This next slide will sort of set the tone for the rest of the day. Are you ready? Here it comes. Did anyone not know this? Okay, the utility industry actually calls this a brownout, <clears throat> just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Thank you, I'll be here all day. I want to tell you a story about this slide, but I don't have a story about this slide because that strikes me as kind of gross. They told me not to get off the stage, so what did I do? <laughs> here I am, baby. This slide is really interesting. So a couple years ago, I wrote this goofy book. And I promise you, if I'd have thought somebody would read this book, if I'd have thought it would be read, I'd have proofread it, I promise you. But I wrote it, and it just sold like crazy. And it's weird. Now, for a safety book to sell like crazy, you got to sell like 35 of them. And my mom bought like seven, and Steve Scott bought like six, right? <clears throat> but they asked me to speak at this big meeting in Las Vegas, the American Society of Safety Engineers meeting. So we're in the basement of the Flamingo Hotel. There's 6,500 safety guys, right? Have you hung out much with professional safety guys? So they're not that fun, you know what I mean? <laughs> and like 6,500, it's not like 6,500 times the fun. What it is is a whole bunch of people using handrails in Vegas. It's weird. <laughs> Everyone holding on to crap, you know what I mean? So I get in this big room and I think, I'm gonna use this slide because why wouldn't you use this slide? I mean, I can't think of a reason to not use this slide anywhere and in Vegas, it is the perfect fit, right? So I pop it up gets a pretty good response. I'm pretty impressed. I'm getting ready to give the rest of my presentation. I look up. This is totally true, you guys. And in the back of the room, there's a guy with his hand up. And I think, huh, I never imagined this slide would get a question. <laughs> Seriously, if I had a question about this slide, I probably wouldn't ask anybody. I'm just <laughs> kind of tossing that out. Maybe I'd Google it later. I don't know. I mean, so now I'm in this dilemma, I don't know what to do. Should I go on, should I stop, should I take that? Like a good presenter wouldn't stop, but I'm not that good, right? And plus I'm dying to know, what could he possibly say? So I stopped the meeting, and this is totally true, the guy stands up from the back of the room, I said, sir, you have a question? He stands up and he says, does the order you take them in make a difference? <laughs> so I added this line, boom, right? Perfect. Now, I want to talk to you today about this glove, but I'm not in the mood right now. The mood kind of went away. So I'm going to have to bring that back up somewhere in the presentation to talk about. Before we go much further, though, I do want to talk to you a little bit about the journey you guys have been on. Because I think this is really important. So if I were to make a chart and draw accident numbers for you guys, right, it looks something like this, probably. And in fact, one of the things we ought to talk about is that really when it comes to safety, this conference, which is amazing, maybe the best safety conference I've ever attended, no kidding, this isn't a conference about being safe. This is a conference about being safer. Because you guys start from a, an amazing place, and if you look at your history, it's remarkable. But we ought to talk about how this journey happened. And the first block I'd put up here is this one. 
We started our safety programs by making a set of rules and then asking people to follow them. And we rolled out what I think was kind of a weapon, which is behavior. Now, I don't like behavior, which I'm pretty sure is why they let me come. I mean, I think if I did like it, I probably would not get invited, right? But the reason I don't like behavior is because behavior makes safety an individual program, worker by worker, person by person. All we think we can fix is your behavior. And quite honestly, that's pretty limiting because the assumption is, is that somehow when you screw something up, you did it on purpose. Like a better person would have made a better decision. Your behavior sucks. Yours is really good. Oh, I got that wrong. Your behavior sucks. Yours is really good. Sorry, sorry. I got confused, right? What happened, and you guys live in this world, is even more interesting. When we did this, our event numbers got lower because a standard for performance is really important. But I'm going to say something that's really bold. I believe in this room, I'm surrounded by a group of people that this is true. More rules will not make you more safe. With the clapping, what is all the clapping? Why aren't you clapping? You're angry, aren't you? Do you need a hug? Get up, get up. I saw a tear in his eye. No, I'm not gonna hug you sitting down, that's creepy. Dude, you're a good hugger, Thank all right. You. You're Right? So then we started looking, and we actually started saying, you know, we can design a plant to be a lot safer, and we did it. We put guards and railing, and we put all sorts of protections, and what's interesting is when we started designing, we got better still. But now the line goes down, and then it kind of plateaus out, right? And that plateau, that line that goes down in that plateau, that line's got a name. Do you know what that's called? It's one of my favorite words because it sounds dirty, but it's not. What do you call a process line that goes down and heads evens out, but it never gets to zero? Anyone know? Ready? Asymptote. If you're pumping gas and somebody turned to you and said, asymptote. <laughs> that doesn't sound that good, really, right? <laughs> right? What's interesting to me about this asymptote is this is where we are. In fact, if nothing else happens this morning, I want you to think about the fact that any time you get into a curve that goes down, levels out, and doesn't get to zero, what that tells you is that the strategy you're using is no longer effective. It got you to where it got you, but it's not going to get you to where you want to be. That, my friends, introduces a third approach. And that's when we don't look at the worker as an individual. And we don't look at the plant design. We look at the place where the worker and the design meet. And we ask questions like this. It should be easier to do a job safely than it is to do a job dangerously. And we build systems where the outcome is stability. But I'm not done. My whole life's work is about this next button. And Mike started today in a moment of silence for three workers. What scares the crap out of me is this. Really good organizations kill people. And I want to say something to you, and I want you to listen, because the potential for this to sound wrong is high. The tools you're using to manage ankle sprains and hand cuts are not the same tools that manage fatality. And one of the questions when you go back to your shop I want you to think about is this one. Are the things that hurt people the same things that kill people? And my guess is the answer is gonna be no. And so that tells me that you're really gonna start managing two forms of safety. The industrial safety picture, hand cuts, ankle sprains, you know that. But you're also gonna start managing a catastrophic failure mode. And here's what I'm going to tell you. The only way we can determine a potential fatality is not looking at a failure. Fatalities live in success. In fact, I'm going to say something to you guys that you'll get, and a bunch of people don't get this. Fatalities don't have near misses. Want to know how I can say that? 
Because if you had a near miss to a fatality, 10 bucks says you'll fix it. You have to start understanding how work happens when it's successful. And this sounds so crazy, but you do it every single day. This is vital. But let me take it one step further. Let me show you the shift that's happening, and you tell me what you think about it. Traditional safety, which you're experts in, looks like this. The worker is the problem. So in order to make safety better, we fix the worker. And the way we fix the worker is we constrain the worker. We tell the worker either what to do or most often what not to do. And we measure safety in the absence of accidents. I'm here to tell you, and I weigh 300 pounds and I'm a ninja, I'm not certified in Pennsylvania, but I'll whip it out if you need me to, okay? I'm here to tell you that that thinking is wrong. I think there's a better way. You guys are the best crowd ever. Mike, I'm never stopping. This is where I want to push you. Workers are not the problem. Workers are the solution. Why that's controversial escapes me, but it does escape me. And if workers are the problem solvers, then you know what we ought to do? Instead of constraining the workers, we ought to ask the workers what they need in order to do this job safely. But to do that, we have to shift what we see as success. Success is not the absence of an accident. Success is the presence of capacity. When Volvo says they're gonna make a fatality-free car, they're not saying they're gonna make a car that won't wreck. In fact, you guys, they're actually saying we're gonna make a car that we know is gonna wreck. Somebody somewhere is gonna run it off a bridge or hit a tree or roll it or smack into a truck. When it happens, we want that car to have the capacity so that when it fails, the occupants of that vehicle can live to drive another day. Actually, I'm pretty sure what they say is live to buy another Volvo. We can talk about that later, right? <laughs> right? And what's amazing is when you read that article, and I kind of feel like a lot of you will, there are six car companies that actually can make the claim of zero fatalities. Now, this is remarkable. Now, we're friends by now, yeah? You feel good? We hugged, so I know we're friends, right? <laughs> Let me explain what, what it's like to work. You guys tell me if I'm wrong, because I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty certain I can describe what you do every single day. Ready? I think you guys are as safe as you need to be without being overly safe, because quite honestly, between us, that's just stupid, in order to be productive. What do you think? So I said, I showed this slide the other day, and this lady said, uh, I find that slide offensive. And I said, are you kidding me? The laxative slide didn't trigger you? <laughs> this is the one you're mad about? <laughs> okay. Here's what's interesting to me about this, is my guess is this is a pretty good description of how you do it. And the crazy thing is, is I think we've built this case where somehow production and safety are separate. And that may be true like in a boardroom. Where it's not true is for all of you and all your brothers and sisters who are doing the job. There's not like a separate safety and a separate production. It's the same thing. And what you do is you constantly balance it out. Let me ask this question of you. Think about this. When you drive to work, how do you know you're safe enough while you're driving? So you just said you don't. And what's amazing about that answer, it's brave, first of all, it's also really true. That safety, especially in a big plant like you guys work in, high risk, lots of things going on, complexity happening, Safety is almost always a retrospective value. The crazy thing about when you're doing work is that you're constantly managing not safety, what you're managing is risk. And I say this all the time, and I truly believe it. You don't want workers that are scared of risk. You want workers that are good with risk, that understand when the operation gets more dangerous, production slows. And when the operation gets easier, production increases. It's like driving in the rain. If it's a perfect day, there's no traffic and no policemen, your efficiency is going to go up, right? If it's rainy and there's tons of cops, you're going to slow her down a little bit, right? 
Because you'll trade off that real time risk versus stability. And what you guys are experts at, experts at, is managing that relationship between risk and stability. And here's what I think is amazing. And it really does amaze me, especially looking out at you guys. You're really, really good at this. Because you know what you mostly do? Not have accidents. You mostly in real time are detecting and correcting and managing risk incredibly effectively until you're not. And that's what we should talk about. Now, by federal law, I have to show a video. I tried to get out of it, but the Supreme Court would not hear my case. So there we go. <clears throat> and I have to show a video involving an alligator. It's just the law. So I'm about to show you the world famous Kenny the Alligator Wrestler video. If you haven't seen this before, I need to give you a little warning. It involves a guy named Kenny Cypress and an alligator, Steve. Let's say the alligator's named Steve. <clears throat> Seems like a good name for an alligator, right? Kenny's gonna stick his head in Steve's mouth. Steve's gonna bite Kenny's head. Now, he doesn't die and it's not bloody, but it's incredibly graphic. If this offends your sensibilities, you have my permission to turn your head and look away. I don't give a crap because the people next to you will tell you everything that happened anyway. <laughs> Watch this carefully, because when it's done, I'm gonna ask you some questions, ready? This is Kenny, the alligator wrestler. Miami, Florida. Tourists from all over the world come to the Miccosukee Indian Village for traditional foods, handmade crafts, and Kenny Cypress's alligator wrestling show. Climbing into a pool of hungry alligators is a terrifying proposition, but not for Kenny. He's lived and worked with these dangerous reptiles all his life. Kenny begins his show by wrestling this 10-foot, 350-pound gator out of the water. Easier said than done. Kenny demonstrates that an alligator will normally keep its jaws open, unless you touch the inside of its mouth. All it takes is the slightest sensation. Even a grain of sand will trigger these powerful jaws to clamp shut. He invites the crowd to try it themselves. Is anybody interested? As always, there are no takers. Kenny continues with his usual routine, unaware that his good luck is about to run out. It's New Year's Day. Kenny attempts the grand finale that has thrilled thousands of people putting his head inside the gator's mouth. And the jaws are open, and the head is in! Boom! Ah! The gator's jaws slam shut and lock Kenny in a vice-like death grip. Another trainer struggles to free him, but the gator won't let go. Shaking its head, the deadly reptile drives its razor-sharp teeth deeper into Kenny's skull. Get the wood! Get the wood! Other trainers rush in and try to open the gator's mouth but a wooden stick is useless against the 3,000 pounds of pressure that's being exerted on Kenny's head. The gator has tasted blood, and he's not about to let go. Eventually, the trainers manage to pry open the gator's powerful jaws, giving Kenny a chance to escape. He pulls his head free and staggers away as the men subdue the angry beast. Kenny is rushed to the hospital, dazed and bleeding. Almost a year later, he has still not fully recovered from his injuries. I had a hole straight through here, going inside my mouth. I had one tooth in my ear, the larger tooth inside my ear, so my hearing ain't that great on my right side. Kenny had performed this stunt many times before, so what went wrong this time? I got careless. Kenny mops the sweat off his face before the stunt begins, but he forgets to wipe the right side. When I leave my head in there, the sweat dropped on his tongue, and. He decided to bite me. That single drop of sweat was enough to trigger the gator's massive jaws to snap shut. But even though he was nearly killed, Kenny doesn't blame the gator. When you go messing with animals that are dangerous, that's what you get. You leave them alone, they leave you alone. <laughs> Kenny still wrestles alligators, but he doesn't try this stunt anymore. Oh, I'd do it in a heartbeat, but I can't, you know. I promised my wife and my kids I wouldn't do that anymore. A promise that his family hopes he keeps. Finish this sentence, ready? Kenny is 
dumbass, I heard that. I heard stupid over here. Who said awesome? Somebody over here said awesome. I like you. I always secretly wait for either the words sweaty or tasty. Those are the ones I want. I never get them, but I always think that. What's going on here? Why would I show you this video? Let me ask this. Whose fault is this? Let's vote. This will help me a ton. By a show of hands, how many of you think this is Kenny's fault? Okay, how many of you think it's not Kenny's fault? Like, I'm thinking management. I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> what is going on? Why would I show you this video? What's going on? Well, maybe I should ask this question. This looks so egregious. I mean, this guy's, this is crazyville, right? I mean, this guy, he sticks his head in an alligator's mouth. But I actually think this is a pretty good model of what you guys do. So let me ask this question. Louisiana people, you're out of this one, okay? Don't go literal. <clears throat> do you have alligators in your plants? Okay, the Louisiana guys are like, and outside of the plant, and in the yard, right? Okay, got that. So you have things that can bite people. Do you have kinnies in your plant? Are there any in this room? <laughs> point at them. This will save a lot of time, actually. We could potentially get to lunch early if you point at them. What's amazing to me about this is how you look at this is going to color what you do. And what's remarkable is this Kenny video, I think, is a really, really good analogy of what I do every single day, what you do every single day, which is interface with risk. Now, probably the best way to do this is to tell you a story. And I got a bazillion stories, but I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to cut this one really short. I was doing a big investigation on a high explosive failure. I don't know if you've ever done one before, but generally they're super interesting. And this one was really cool because they dropped the largest piece of high explosive they've ever made in the history of mankind. Seriously, the largest one. They dropped it 44 inches into gravel, and it didn't explode. Now, I don't know how many high explosive investigations you guys have done, but generally, you don't get to talk to the people who screwed up because nobody ever lives through a high explosive failure. But in this time, they did. And in the middle of this investigation, these guys from D.C. call and they say there's been a really bad train crash. And this is kind of the first of the new suite of train crashes that have happened in about the last 10 years. They said there's been a really bad train crash in Los Angeles in a place called Chatsworth, California. Now, this is about 10 years ago. And so one of the guys on our team was an expert from the NTSB in a high explosive shipping stuff. And they said, well, come and help us set it up. And I don't know if you remember this crash, but it was a small commuter train light rail called Metrolink Rail, and it had a head-on collision with a Union Pacific freight train at 41.5 miles an hour, and it instantly killed 28 people, including the operator. Do you remember this? Do you remember what happened? I'm going to give you the international symbol. Ready? He was, I better do it for the camera. He was texting. He was texting and he didn't stop at a red light. In fact, he didn't even hit the brakes. He flew straight through that red light and smashed into that oncoming freight train. It was breaking, but it takes a long time to stop a freight train. Now, here's my question. Is texting the reason that crash happened? What do you think? I'm saying this stuff out loud, right? Okay, because for a minute I thought, am I just thinking all this crap? Because you're really polite if I'm just not saying anything. Is texting the problem? It's a pretty egregious thing to do. I mean, it's a, that's a crazy thing to do, right? Here's what's interesting. Let me give you the business plan for Metrolink Rail. Listen carefully. 100% of the time, 100% of train drivers will stop at 100% of red lights with 100% accuracy. What's wrong with that? People are not machines. If you need machine reliability, you know what you need? Machine. But if you need adaptability, if you need problem solving, if you need somebody to look at and manage variability, then you need you. Because the thing you bring to the table is amazing. You bring the ability to solve thousands of tiny problems a day 
to keep production, production. I can't train a machine because I can't imagine what the thousands of problems you're gonna see. When I asked what the most important safety feature in a vehicle, the first thing I heard when I was up on that stage is driver. You want me to tell you something about the driver? The driver is the most important part of vehicle safety, while simultaneously the least reliable safety system in the vehicle. What's crazy about this train story is this. If the problem is the operator, you're gonna fix the operator. But I'd actually suggest you could replace texting with anything. Like I'm thinking heart attack, that'd be interesting, right? I'm also thinking nude sunbathers, but I always am kind of thinking nude sunbathers. <laughs> That's always kind of in there. Full blown burrito blowout, you know what I mean? <laughs> Have you had one of these? That's when you buy a really beautiful burrito, you bite the top and the insides just kind of poop out the bottom of the tortilla. <laughs> Skinny people don't think this is a problem, but I would wear the burrito the rest of the day. <laughs> Anything that distracted that operator from that red light is gonna be a problem. In fact, I think the question you ask is the problem. If you ask why didn't the operator stop at the red light, you're gonna fix the operator. But if you ask this question, why didn't the red light stop the train. Then what you're going to look at is something entirely different. Anytime you put a worker in a position where the only defense they have against dying is that they'll be perfect, you know what you're making? A single point failure. But you know what you're really making? Your very own alligator wrestling show. This alligator video is amazing. You should show it at every safety meeting. I can't think of a reason to not show it. But the reason you show it is not because a guy gets his bit, head bit with an alligator. I mean, that's totally cool watching. The reason you show it is because that is a perfect example of a single point failure. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. At your plants, one of the things your workers know is where those defenses get skinny. And one of the questions I love to ask is, where are you one defense away from chopping off your finger? Because if I can find that, all I need to do is add one other defense, and I've doubled the level of protection. But to do that, I've got to step away from blaming the worker and really move towards understanding the system. Think of it kind of like this, okay? You guys in your clapping, you're the clappiest people. This is my picture of a sharp stick. Let's populate it. At the very pointy end of that stick is you, right? Behind them is management, leadership, the company, customer. And at the very far end is the regulator. Now, here's my question. Who's most likely to get injured? The worker. Why are they most likely to get injured? Because they're closest to the risk. Now, I want you to always think about this. The worker has the most significant interface with the risk. But question two is when this gets interesting. Who has the most influence over the risk? Regulator. What's crazy is that risk moves towards the sharp end, power moves towards the blunt end. And here's where this all gets different. I think there's a belief that somehow our plants are inherently safe. I got news for you. The plant where you work is not inherently safe. You actually create safety in real time in that plant. If you did nothing, the outcome is incredibly predictable. What you're doing is actually creating safety in real time. And to do that, we have to understand one sort of theoretical thing, and that is what an accident looks like. So an accident has three parts. There's the context, that's everything that leads up to the consequence that's where the two trains collide and 28 people die. And then there's the retrospective way we look at the accident after it happens. Context, consequence, retrospect. Now, for extra credit, who can tell me what the least interesting part of this is? Is it context, is it consequence, or is it retrospect? Which part of this model is least interesting? You wanna go with context? You locking it in, you look confident. Okay, okay, that's your final answer. It's wrong, but God bless you for playing. <laughs> it got way easier. Okay, now you can flip a coin. Retrospect, you wanna go with retrospect? Final answer? 
you committed. Are you smarter than he is? Okay. <clears throat> That's also wrong, but you've now made this super easy. What's left? So I'm going to tell you this, and I don't know if you've thought about this very much, but the least interesting part of an accident is what happened. And I'll bet you, at your company, they treat consequences as if it's superhuman. But here's what I want you to think about. The bar is changing in safety. You cannot afford to wait to respond to consequence. The accident is happening in the context. It's already happened in the consequence. And suddenly, those little small signals that tell you a system is drifting become really important because that's what you use to actually manage consequence. The bar's moving from consequence management to context management. But to do that, I have to sell you on this idea. This is super controversial. I don't believe workers cause accidents. What I think a worker does is trigger an accident. And the reason I can say that to you is that stupid alligator video. 10 minutes ago, you thought the wild part of that video was the alligator. But I'm about to tell you something. Consequence is so predictable that in fact, the most predictable part of Kenny's show is the alligator. The alligator is biologically designed so that if something hits the inside of its mouth, it shuts in and eats it. What's crazy is that the consequence is really obvious. It's the context that makes a huge difference. And this switch pushes us away from cause and really into the notion of managing complexity. Because you've known this a long time, but a worker who cuts his hand off didn't cause his hand to be cut off. He triggered something sharp enough to actually make that accident happen. How smart are you feeling? On a scale of one to two, one is stupid, two's a genius, no fractions, where are you right now? Uh, it seems like two's the only answer, right? <clears throat> Let's have a quiz, ready? What's the problem? <laughs> Anybody wanna take, there's 46 pallets on this van. I'm not bragging to you guys, but I took this picture, okay? And this is not some exotic country, unless you think Atlanta is exotic, then it totally is, because it's in Atlanta. I stopped to get a Coke, I come out of the, the, the quick trip place, God's chosen convenience store, the doors go like that, and angels go, oh, and this is parked in front of me. <laughs> so I took this picture and I went out to talk to the guy and he drove away, because I'm pretty sure he thought nothing that guy's got to say I want to hear. What's the problem? Yeah, what's the problem? What's the problem? Height, okay, that's good. Center of gravity's good. Two minutes, wrong tool. That's the answer, wrong tool. He took a van to a truck job. Now, I know nothing about this picture, nothing, except for one thing. That guy's a hell of a pallet stacker. <laughs> if you've ever stacked a pallet, you know you lose interest at about two. And I'm pretty certain he did not accidentally do this, right? He doesn't turn around and go, crap, I accidentally stacked 46 pallets on a van. And what's amazing is if you look at this and think consequence, you're going to think bad guy. But if you look at it and think context, you're going to think what kind of system is he in where that outcome makes a difference. Now, I'm about to give you my secret weapon. And I promise you guys, and I don't mean to oversell this, but this changes everything. This will completely change your plans. All I need to do is get you to change your questions. Do me a favor, the next time something happens, a near miss, a close call, an operational upset, maybe even an accident, switch your thinking from who failed to what failed. What's amazing about that, you guys, is it gives you an entirely new set of things to fix. And what's remarkable, you guys, I'm never leaving, I promise. What's remarkable about this is this is so stinking easy and it is so stinking powerful and I don't know why we don't do it. But I can give you a perfect example of why we should. A couple months ago, you and the wife flew to Hawaii for a dream vacation. 
It's Saturday morning, and your phone's out there on the table, and it makes a weird buzz, kind of a buzz you're not used to, like an amber alert buzz. And you pick your phone up, and it says, you've got 20 minutes to live. <laughs> I don't know if you have a plan for this. I do. If I ever get that, three things are going to happen almost immediately. I'm going to start smoking, because why not? <laughs> I'm going to eat as much bacon as I possibly can, and I'm going to try to make sweet love to anybody. Because <laughs> that's how I want to go. <laughs> that's, I've thought about this, right? If you ask who failed, you're going to talk about a poor operator in a control room who pulls down a pull-down menu and accidentally clicks the wrong thing, right? And then you're going to talk about that operator in a system that's so egregious that he refuses to be a part of the investigation and that he's charged with a crime and that he's terminated from his employment. And what scares me is when we fired him and we gave him justice, what we fix? Because when you ask what failed, you're going to tell the story of, do I really want one person and one pull-down menu on a Saturday morning to have the ability to send out an amber alert that says we're all going to die? And if we do accidentally send one out, I'd like to have a thing that could suck it back really fast if it's wrong, right? That difference between who and what is foundational to the next level. If you're going to bust that asymptote, you've got to say we've done as much as we can fixing the worker. The one that scares me the most is Chattanooga, Tennessee, November of last year. A 32-year-old school bus driver off his route, going over speed, down a canyon, hits a culvert, turns the bus on its side, and kills six children between the age of seven and five. Kids between seven and five shouldn't die on the way to school. What scares me is we put that driver in jail. But what we fix? You're talking about a system, a school bus? We put more protection in a carnival ride. Now, I'm not talking Disney. I'm talking Carney. You know what I mean, right? One tooth. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean, <laughs> no, I can tell, right? We put more protection in a carnival ride. A bus has very little capacity to fail. It's a system that's set up that says the driver needs to be perfect all the time. And you know what happens when you build a system that's based upon perfection. So where does this take us? We have to stop seeing the workers as a problem. It's not taking us anywhere. And what scares me most of all in this room is what do we fix? Blaming a worker for an accident is like peeing in your pants. It's an immediate relief, and then it's kind of creepy. <laughs> what we have to realize is that next level of improvement, we're going to have to leverage the people who understand the plan. Because if you want to know how work is done, who do you talk to? The workers, because every day they interface in real time with risk. Every day they understand and use the systems that make us good or bad. In fact, what's so powerful to me is that the workers are the masters of complex adaptive behavior. They're the masters of how the plant works. When I asked you about driving to work, I was secretly thinking of this slide. You know what safe looks like. You also know what danger looks like. The problem is, is I never put you in 100% safe because I don't really think that exists. And God forbid I'd put you in 100% danger. That just seems mean. Where I put you every single day is in the space between safe and danger. That gray area is really interesting. And what's interesting about it is that the lines that delineate good from bad, those lines are constantly in motion. In fact, when do I know exactly when the worker screwed up? When it fails. And what scares me, you guys, is this is what we investigate, but this is what happened. This is what we write corrective actions to, but this is what work looks like. And if we can't tell this story, we can't fix the problem. So let's take it one step further. This is what I believe perfect work looks like. This is on time, on budget, high quality, no waste, procedure following, rule following, good training, qualified, look good, smell good. This is perfect world. That is the way we believe work happens. Everybody got it? If that's the black line, what's this line? So here's what I'm going to tell you, and you know this, 
That's reality. In fact, I don't know if you've thought about this very much, but procedures aren't real. Procedures are the ideal state for how work happens. What you manage every single day is not the procedure. What you manage every single day is the variability around the procedure. And what's amazing to me is the blue line really indicates that you spend as much time overperforming your systems as you do underperforming your systems. Well, let's take this away and let's talk about wrestling an alligator. So here's Kenny, right? His blue line is probably going to look something like this, right? Because he drifted way out, he got into some trouble. And what's amazing is as you drift, hazards start to move into the system. And pretty soon, you don't only just have one line, you got three lines. You got the, red, the black line, the blue line, and the red line. Now, what the company's done, and I'll bet you I'm right on this, is they spent a ton of time fixing this gap. Let's get reality in line with the process. And some companies are bold enough to say, let's move the process so it's in line with reality. But I'm going to suggest to you guys, and I probably don't have to sell this very hard in this room, that that gap is normal. In fact, I think you're probably in this room because what you're really good at in your plant is managing that gap. That's not the gap that freaks me out. What's the gap that freaks me out? There's only one left and it's up there. I feel like you'll get this. That's the gap. And if I said anything to you today that's meaningful, it would be this. You have to tell the story of what's happening. Because the blue line is in fact the story of every failure. But you know what else the blue line is? The story of every single success you've ever had. The blue line is you. And what you bring to the table is a real-time understanding, not of just the process, but of the variability that you manage in the plant. Asking you to help me understand gives me better information than if I hold you accountable to the black line. So where does this take us? Well, this slide's really important, and I put it in just for you guys. When nothing's happening at your plant, a lot of things are happening. Safety is a dynamic non-event. You work your butt off to make sure people don't get hurt. What scares me is I think the belief is, is when no accidents are happening, everything's running smooth. That's not true. When no accidents are happening, you're out there in real time interfacing with risk and adapting, correcting and detecting and fixing it in real time. That's enormously important to what we think about. So where does this take us? Is the juice worth the squeeze? This is my very favorite slide in the whole world. And I think the answer is, yeah, it's worth it. But to get you there, one of the things I have to tell you is that we have to start responding earlier to operator discomfort. Look for places where we put the worker in a position where there's a conflict between doing it right and doing it wrong. Because the earlier we can identify this problem, the more capacity we have to handle this problem. If we wait for the problem to get big, look what doesn't change. Oh wait. <laughs> That's important. So where does this take us? I think you have two choices. For the managers in this room, I'm talking to you. When something happens, you make a strategic decision about your operation. And that is you have two choices, and these are deliberate choices. You can blame and punish, or you can learn and improve. But you can't do both. If you choose to blame and punish, you're giving up learning. And there are probably events that happen where blame and punish is the right answer. You come to work drunk, maybe we should punish you. 
But if you choose to learn and improve, what you're buying is the ability to understand that blue line. What you're giving up is that ability to, to punish the bad guy. And the best story I could tell you, and I really feel like I should tell this in this room, is I was in Salt Lake City at a refinery, and the plant manager was really struggling with this slide. And he said to me, I can do both. And I said, you can't. It's like going east-west. You can't go east-west, right? They're, they're opposing theories. You cannot do both. And he said, well, I believe I can. And I said, I don't think it's possible. And it starts to get a little heated. And one of the people in the class raised his hand and he said, can I translate this into Utah? Well, if somebody ever says that in a class you're in, the only answer to that is yes. I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd like to hear this translated into Utah. And he looked at that plant manager and he said, if you disapprove of your daughter's first boyfriend, you'll never meet the second. If I'd have had a microphone, I'd have dropped it. <laughs> what amazes me is how poignant that is in illustrating this idea. This, my friends, is everything. And it's a strategic decision. And that decision just doesn't belong to management. In this room, I'm going to tell you something. Oftentimes, the harshest critics of our behavior is us. I need you to write this down and think about this as well. Before you react mindlessly, I'd like you to think about reacting mindfully. Which brings me to the glove. So I asked permission to tell this story and I actually thought the guys from UAW were gonna be here but something happened and they couldn't come. But I don't know if you know this, but there's a company called Ford, have you heard of this? So you heard, you've heard of them. They have 10 manufacturing facilities, and for about 15 years, give or take a couple years, they average six finger amputations per year per facility. So 10 plants, six finger amputations per plant. Quick, what's the grand total per year? 60. And they said, that's unacceptable. That's just not right. And the UAW and the company got together and they said, we got to do something. We got people in our plant that can no longer give high five. <laughs> We're ruining the pool of banjo players that are being sent out into the world, right? We got to do something about this. And so you know what they decided to do? A hand safety campaign. And they got some posters and some stickers and some banners. They had pictures of a man's hand and a baby's hand. They had big signs that say, don't cut your hand off. Do not amputate your finger. Good workers amputate fewer fingers than bad workers. And they rolled this program out hard and fast across the country. They put together a training course where they brought people into a room and told them not to cut off their fingers. And they hit it big. And they spent a lot of money on it. And what do you think happened to their totals? Stayed the same. Because if you cut off 60 fingers 10 years in a row, I'm not a betting man, but I'd bet a couple bucks that the 11th year, it's going to come in somewhere around 60. Because your system is perfectly attuned to get what it gets. If you want something different, you got to bust that asymptote. So the UAW guys got together and they said, we want to try this new idea. The worker's not the problem, the worker's the solution. So they put together 10 little teams at each plant and they said, you got two days. We're going to tackle finger amputations. You can do anything you want to and there's unlimited pizza. <laughs> Just saying, right? It's the currency of our world, right? The only rule is, listen to this carefully, you can't talk about hands. So they got together and they said, why is it that 15 years ago, we all of a sudden went to this 60 number? What changed? And they said, you know, it was about 15 years ago when we switched over to 24 volt DC nut drivers. Before they had that, they went from wrench to socket to pneumatic to AC to DC. 
What changes in that little story between wrench and DC nut driver? Starts with T and rhymes with pork. Torque. What do we know about a 24 volt DC nut driver? It's got a lot of torque. In fact, when you trigger that nut driver, there's not a lot of escape time. It happens fast because it's a direct drive. And then they said, how many times do we expose the worker to this hazard? And they counted up and it was 10,000 times a month. 10,000 times a month. And they said, wow. That's a lot of opportunity to get your finger cut off. A good worker is probably going to have one near miss a month. A bad worker may be having three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten near misses a month. There's a lot of opportunity for this to fail. They said, let's not try to manage the accident. Let's manage the capacity to have this accident safely. What do you see? You guys, these are gloves with tearaway fingers. What's amazing about this is that I would have never thought of this in a hundred billion years, maybe longer. What is the biggest number? A hundred gazillion years, right? What's remarkable about this is what happened next. Ask me how many finger amputations Ford had two years ago. Zero. Last year, zero. And what's amazing is, is what they said is, these gloves are our idea, and everybody wears gloves, so they didn't have a problem with glove use. They said when a person gets their finger ripped off, it's a celebration, not a punishment. And when they come to replace that glove with the torn finger, we're gonna do a mini investigation right then, and we're gonna ask them what happened and how did it happen. Congratulations, here's a new glove. And what they did was build a system that allowed them to learn and understand that process. And out of that came a really interesting story. It wasn't the glove getting caught between the nut driver socket and the nut. It was the fact that if you run a socket 10,000 times, three shifts, so that's 30,000 times a month, it burrs out. And those burrs were catching the gloves, and that's what was pulling the fingers in. They got a different form of socket, a different metal, and they actually took that hazard away. Now, I don't know if these gloves are a good idea or a bad idea, because I don't know anything about this business, but what I know is they solved this problem in a much different way. They did something really important. They realized that the workers weren't the problem, they were the solution. Instead of telling the workers not to cut their fingers off, they asked the workers what they need in order to make this fail gracefully. And then they counted success as not as the absence of amputated fingers, but as the presence of these gloves. Safety is not the absence of accidents. I'm sorry because lots of people have told you for years and years and years that every accident is preventable and that if you work hard enough and take care of the small ones, the big ones will solve themselves. That's not true. The reason an organization like you guys still kill people is because the things that kill people are not the same things that hurt people. What you manage is not accident. What you manage is capacity. I got one more special slide for you. So I told you I had to teach a class yesterday morning, so I got in here a little late. Jim and Mike are so kind, they checked me into a fabulous hotel. I don't know if I could pronounce it, I think it's French, Hampton Inn. Am I saying that right? Am I saying it right? It's French, I didn't know what it was. I get into the room, I'm making myself comfortable, you know, doing my stuff, and I look up, and the housekeeper clearly forgot to stash something, but I actually think it's the happiest accident that's ever happened in my life. I look over on the counter, and this is on the counter. <laughs> now, this is handy in all kinds of uses, but I learned something today. I don't know if you can see this well. I'll highlight the part that really interested in me. <laughs> you guys... I'm not ashamed to admit it. I've been using amateur my whole life. <laughs> Let's just say last night I moved up a level.
I want to share with you one other thing. If you get a chance and you want to keep this conversation going, the one thing that I have that I can offer you guys, it doesn't cost anything, is uh, I got this little podcast that started a couple years ago. Now there's like a half a million people that listen to it. All we talk about is this. In fact, one of my proudest moments is this fine gentleman. You dress up nice. I've actually never seen you dressed up. You look good. It's like you're ready for a funeral now. I mean, just like, <laughs> right? My, Mike's on it, and he, he's remarkable. What it is, is it's just, it's just conversations where we talk about these new ideas and new safety, and what we really do, you guys, which is something I'd highly encourage you to do, is celebrate success. Because what I'm more interested in your plant is not how you fail. I'm way more interested and how you guys succeed. That's my time. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank like you. I'm going to shake your hand, buddy. Thank you. Thanks.